Hi guys, my name is Ben Guilford. I'm the owner of The Firebrick Company and today I, I, I start every video, I'm pretty sure I start every video by saying how excited I am. Uh, and part of me thinks I should change that but I'm always excited and I'm extra excited today because we're doing something that I have been thinking about for years. Now I was hoping to film this uh, in America with one of our wonderful American customers because it just felt right. However, uh, COVID change those plans. Uh, and so we're gonna be filming here in Melbourne, Australia today. And what we're filming is how to use your oven as a smoker. Right, so you'd be really familiar with the oven behind me as a pizza oven. Uh, and if you've watched any of our other videos, you will have found that we try really hard not to call it a pizza oven. In fact, I, I try my best to call it a wood fired oven because it's not just for cooking pizza. It cooks amazing pizza, like fantastic for cooking pizza. It's the right way to cook pizza, but uh, it's not just for pizza. You can do all kinds of other cooking in a wood fired oven. And that's one of the things that I love the most about them. Uh, and so today we're gonna be showing you one of the more, oh, not obscure ways of cooking, but it's not one that might spring to mind. When you look at a wood fired oven, you might think pizza, baking, uh, maybe some grilling, uh, but smoking might not be something that comes immediately to mind for you as something that you can do in a wood-fired oven. And so today I'm hoping to change that. Now, I'll be really upfront with you. I am an engineer. I am not a chef by any means. Uh, if you watched our last video, our Flamesmith Feast, um, you would have met uh, the beautiful and very handsome Marcus, uh, who is and sadly not with us today. His apron hangs on the wall uh, alone. Uh, and that's because Marcus, uh, very excitingly, is a new dad. So I guess that's a reasonable excuse for not being here today. Uh, but we miss Marcus, so all you've got is me, so deal with it. Uh, but, so my point being, uh, I am not here to tell you exactly all the ins and outs of smoking. Uh, there's, that's a whole world uh, that I do not pretend to be uh, the, the boss of, um, but I can teach you some stuff uh, that I think you'll find really interesting and will be enough to get you started in your smoking journey in our oven. Before I go any further, I do want to thank one customer in particular, uh, Matt Redman, uh, lives up in Queensland. He's a software engineer, but he also happens to be a very talented uh, low and slow barbecue man. Uh, he's actually part of a competition team, Primal Iron Barbecue. Uh, check them out. They do some amazing stuff. And he has spent a long time on the phone with me quite recently, taking me through ins and outs of smoking uh, and how he's been using his wood-fired oven to do some amazing smoking at home. So, thank you, Matt. You're a wonderful man. Uh, right, so, got lots of cool stuff on the table. Uh, let's talk about smoking in a wood-fired oven. So, if you look at what smoking is, uh, smoking is a method of cooking that uh, requires a source of heat and smoke. Um, there's obviously some more nuance to it than that, but when you boil it all the way down to the, the basics of smoking, if you're doing hot smoking, which is what we're going to be doing today, you require a heat source and you require a smoke source. The most popular method of smoking is using a reverse flow smoker. Uh, how a reverse flow smoker works is you have uh, a smoker box. It's also called an offset smoker. So you have a smoker box that you build a fire in uh, and then the hot gases and smoke from that fire travel up into the, the, the cooking chamber uh, where they pass over the meat and then they exit by the chimney. Okay, and so with, with a reverse flow smoker, you're actually feeding the fire constantly. Uh, you have to put on just the right piece of wood at, at the right time. It's a bit of an art form uh, to, to hold the right temperature. Uh, so you, your heat source is a live fire that you're feeding constantly to maintain the desired temperature. With the wood-fired oven, we don't have to do that, and that is a cool thing. We can actually use residual heat from a firing that we did, well, in this example, two days ago. I can use the residual heat from the firing I did 48 hours ago to smoke uh, my food. That can be the heat source, is the residual heat that's stored in the walls and the floor of the oven. Now, 
With uh, cooking with residual heat in a wood-fired oven, we don't have a heat source. We're not adding any heat to the oven. If we've uh, finished our firing a couple of days ago, any coals that were left have basically burned down to dust. There's pretty well nothing left. Uh, and so we're now working with what is called a falling oven. And so that means the temperature is just slowly, slowly falling because no additional energy, no additional heat is being put into the oven. Uh, now we're gonna be smoking, uh, we're gonna be doing pulled pork today, uh, which we're hoping is gonna take around eight hours uh, to complete. And so if we were to put the pulled pork in uh, with no additional heat source in the oven, we know that the heat is going to drop. So we may start at the ideal temperature of uh, say 130 degrees Celsius, but by eight hours later, well, it could have dropped below the, one of the, the ideal smoking temperature. It could have dropped below 110 uh, over that eight hours. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of fuel to the oven, uh, something that we can control, something that doesn't throw off too much uh, radiant heat, it doesn't burn with a, a big flame. Uh, and that is where charcoal comes in. Uh, now, you can get charcoal in obviously a, a few different forms. Um, you have heat beads, uh, are, are very popular. They are very dense, they burn for a very long time. Uh, so they're a really good option for giving you a controlled uh, source of heat. Or you have lump charcoal, uh, and lump charcoal is a beautiful thing. Uh, if you can get good quality lump charcoal, it is amazing uh, and well well worth um, spending the money on. Uh, now there's also some cool accessories out there for helping you with this. You could just make a little pile of charcoal on the floor in the oven. I've done this before uh, where I've, I've realized, oh, the temperature is dropping a little bit too much and I wanna bump it up. Get a little pile of charcoal just like this uh, with a little natural fire lighter uh, in the middle, pop that in, light it up, and within 10 minutes, I'm bumping the temperature up. Um, you know, I can easily bump it up by 20 degrees very quickly. Um, but it is sort of hard to manage just on the floor. It's sort of hard to get out, you're reaching in, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, I was at the hardware store last night uh, doing some last minute shopping for this video and I found these really cool charcoal baskets uh, that just, they're very convenient, they're very cheap uh, and something that you can just put some charcoal in and uh, slide that into the oven, pushing that you know right, right off to one side so it's not um, gonna be providing very much direct heat to your food. Um, but that is a, a really cool tool for helping you maintain a temperature over time. Because again, if we don't have any heat being put into the oven, the temperature will drop. That's just basic thermodynamics. You, just, you can't avoid that. Uh, as well as we insulate the oven, the temperature is going to fall uh, slowly over time. However, if we have a small heat source like a basket of charcoal, we can maintain a temperature for as long as we want. We just have to keep topping up the charcoal. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So in terms of the, the smoking process, we need heat, we need smoke. Our heat is going to be provided predominantly by the residual heat that's stored in the walls and floor of the oven from a firing that we did earlier but we're going to top up that heat with some charcoal. Uh, just that little basket of charcoal. Again, you don't have to get the basket, but that's a cool little accessory, good birthday present. You could drop hints to the family. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna top up the heat with that. Uh, and that's going to keep the heat right at the point that we want it. Now, uh, I am not the, uh, the, the, the font of knowledge uh, of smoking, but, you will find that there's some pretty clear guidelines on temperatures to smoke in. Uh, so the, the accepted knowledge seems to be that you want to smoke between 110 and 130 degrees. That's considered like low and slow. Um, if you're in a pinch, if you're not wanting to spend 14 hours smoking, um, let's say you have a friend named Joel who's behind the camera who probably doesn't want to be here for 14 hours. Uh, 
you may want to smoke a little faster. So we're actually going to be smoking at around 140 degrees. You can actually go up to even 150 degrees Celsius uh, if you wanted, if you're trying to cook a little bit faster. For us today, we're trying to do a relatively quick smoke. We'll be targeting between 130 and 150 degrees Celsius. Um, if we had more time, if Joel was more patient, maybe, uh, we could target you know, 110 to 130. Uh, it's not that one is necessarily better than the other. Hey, maybe the, the meat comes out a tiny bit more tender uh, if you cook it at that lower temperature, but this is just giving you something, a place to start. Um, and one of the things I really like, even just saying those numbers is, that's a big range. Really, 110 to 150 degrees Celsius, that's a nice big range that you can work in. And the only thing that will happen is if it's at the lower end of that spectrum, it's gonna take longer to, to cook. If it's at the higher end of that spectrum, it's gonna cook more quickly. Uh, and so it's, again, it's another one of those very forgiving uh, kind of processes, which I like because I am not, I am not an expert at this. Okay, so that's our heat. Um, now, smoke. So we, we've dealt with the heat part of hot smoking. Uh, in a wood-fired oven, we know where the heat's coming from and we know how we're gonna manage it. Well, now we need to talk about smoke. How do we get the smoke in there? Now, over the years, I've actually seen some people do some cool stuff. Uh, I have seen people build an offset smoker box that they could put wood into and then put a special duct up into the oven. So remove some bricks from the wall of the oven and plumb it into the side or, or core a hole through the floor of the oven and bring a duct up through the floor. And I've looked at these ways of doing it. I'm like, wow, that is, that is intense. Um, that, that's quite hard to pull off. Um, and it's also very difficult to do after the fact, very difficult. In fact, it's not actually a, a method that we recommend. Um, uh, you can do it, I'm not gonna stop anyone. I'm not your dad, you, can't, you know, you do what you want. But if it was up to me, I would actually suggest, no, you, you don't need to do that. You can develop smoke in a wood-fired oven actually really easily, uh, and there's heaps of cool things that you can use to do that. So the, probably the pure way, the purest uh, way of doing it would be to actually use wood chunks. Right, and so we've got some apple wood here. I've got some pecan or pecan if you're an Australian, um, and I've got these uh, these lumps of uh, wood here that I could put onto my bed of charcoal, my little basket of charcoal. I could just rest a couple of these lumps of wood on that uh, on that charcoal, and that would provide the the heat needed to get this smouldering and giving off smoke. And so um, I'm going to be doing that today. I'm going to be chucking a couple of these onto our little basket and getting some smoke that way. Um, and there is another way though, and as an engineer, this is the method that I really like because in engineering, you really want repeatability. You want to remove as many variables as possible from a situation so that you can get the same result each time. Uh, and so one of the variables would be, well, with using lump wood like this, they're all very different sizes. Are they giving off smoke at a different rate? Um, it's staying on top of the bed of charcoal, making sure there's enough charcoal there to provide the heat to keep the smoke going. Um, this method, I think, requires a little more practice, maybe, and, and, and you develop some skill with it over time. The other method is using pellets. Uh, and these pellets are fantastic. You can get uh, wood pellets in a whole range of flavors. So um, made from apple wood, cherry, pecan, maple, mesquite. I'm sure I'm saying that one wrong. Um, there's, there's a whole range of, of fruit woods out there that are fantastic for smoking that are being made into pellets. Uh, and there's some really cool equipment out there that you can use to burn those pellets. The thing that I like the most about the pellets is you can load them into something like this, this thing here uh, is, they call it the double barrel smoker. We'll put a link in the description uh, if you wanted to buy one of these. We, we, it's not something that we sell, um, but you can find things like this on Amazon, on eBay, at your, at your local barbecue store. They will very likely have something like this where it's a perforated metal container that you fill with pellets, you light one end, of the, uh, the, the container, and then it will burn along like a fuse. It will slowly burn 
along the, uh, the canister, uh, it takes hours. This particular model will burn for about four to five hours, um, depending on the type of pellets that I'm putting in. So these are brilliant because they work the same every time. It's not something that I have to think about. I just go, oh, what flavor do I want? I want cherry, great. Put cherry in, light it up, and away we go. Uh, and so I'm a really big fan of the pellet smoking method. Now, I get to say all this because Marcus isn't here. If Marcus was here, he would guaranteed be saying, no, no, we need to use actual wood in its pure form. We shouldn't be using pellets. Um, but uh, he's not here, so I get to do what I like. Um, but pellets work really well. And so I'm gonna show you how to set up those pellets uh, and we're gonna get that going. Right, so we have our smoker apparatus already here. Uh, so in this case, it's a double barrel smoker. You could be using a smoke maze or something similar to load up with pellets. And then the next question is, well, well, where should we put this in the oven to really get the maximum possible smoke into the meat? Uh, we've experimented with several different ways of doing that. And what we've found works best is actually elevating the tray in the oven so that the smoke flows over the top of it. If you uh, just sit your tray on the floor uh, of the oven, you're gonna find that it's actually sitting in the layer that doesn't get a lot of smoke. Uh, when you light your fire, you'll notice that you immediately get two layers formed. You get a fresh air layer, that's air coming in, feeding the fire, and then you get this layer of smoke uh, that's, that's going out. And you wanna make sure that your meat is actually sitting in that layer uh, that is getting smoke rolling over it, uh, really you know, soaking that meat in smoke so it just gets all that delicious flavor into it. So what we've got here, I've got one of our stainless steel Tuscan grills and I've just flipped that upside down uh, and popped it on a couple of bricks here. Uh, and what I'll be doing is I'll be taking the smoker barrel here and just sliding that underneath and then I'm gonna be lighting that from the front. The smoke will then draw under the grill and then roll over the top of it. Uh, now, uh, that's, that's one way of doing it. I've got some fire bricks here. They don't need to be fire bricks. It could be any brick. Uh, and in fact, well, I've used our stainless steel grill. Um, doesn't have to be a stainless steel grill. Over here, I have another option. Uh, same thing, got our, our tray. This is literally the cheapest wire rack that I could find at our local supermarché. Uh, and I have two bricks from our local hardware store, 99 cents each, uh, basic building bricks. And that again, is gonna do exactly the same thing. It's just there to hold up the, the, the tray, get it nice and elevated uh, so that our smoker can go in underneath. And that's gonna give us exactly the same result. And the reason I wanna show you that is you don't have to go out and you know order one of our grills. You're very welcome to, don't, but don't feel like you have to. Uh, if you're wanting to do some smoking, you could just get the a cooking rack out of the kitchen and just pop it up on a couple of bricks or pavers, something that's gonna support it without falling over uh, and you're done, you're ready to go. Right, we've talked about the oven, how we're gonna manage it, how we're gonna develop our smoke. Uh, now, it's time to actually get on with it and get some meat in the oven. We're gonna be doing pulled pork today. And the reason I'm doing pulled pork is it's one of the easiest things to smoke. Um, everyone else, you would have heard of, you know, brisket, uh, ribs. Um, brisket particularly is probably one of the most tricky things to, uh, to smoke and it, there's a lot to that. So I'm probably gonna get a special guest in to help us with that when we get around to doing that. Today we're gonna be doing pulled pork. I've got about three kilos here. Um, it's a uh, shoulder of pork. Uh, and I went into my local butcher and I said, could you remove the skin, remove most of the fat from the outside uh, and truss it up for me? And voila, here we are. Uh, and I actually made a few mistakes when I started doing this, I wasn't aware that you should remove the skin and the fat. My very first uh, pork shoulder that I did is pulled pork. I left the skin on, I left all the fat on, I smoked it and it came out 
with this leathery brown hide on it that I had to remove and then uh, the fat underneath wasn't rendered down as much as I would have liked. And so um, Matt Redman, as I mentioned before, thank you Matt for all your, your help, um, support, told me, no, no, basically remove all the skin and remove all of the fat from the outside, mo most of it, because it's a fatty cut of meat already. It doesn't need more fat on the outside to protect the, the, the meat. Uh, so that's our meat here. Now the other thing uh, that Matt told me was you take this straight out of the fridge. You don't need to let it come up to room temperature. Uh, you can smoke this straight out of the fridge. And there's actually a few good reasons for doing that. One of them is just food safety, like leaving pork out on the bench is not a great idea. Um, but uh, another one is it's actually better for the smoking because the smoke penetrates into the meat more effectively when it's cold. Uh, which is something I was not aware of. Uh, so straight out of the fridge, I've got this here. I'm gonna pop it in my tray. So the next thing we need to do is put on a rub onto the meat. Uh, and so you can Google um, like rubs for smoking. There's, it's a whole world of itself. Uh, and so it's predominantly, uh, my understanding seems to be it's, it's ground black pepper and salt are the two like main ingredients in any rub but then you get things like paprika and all kinds of other delicious spices involved. Uh, this one actually seems to have coffee in it, which frankly I could use right now. Um, so I'm gonna be using a, a pre-made rub uh, because engineer, not chef. Uh, but if you're wanting to make your own rubs, go crazy. I would highly recommend that you buy um, pre-ground black pepper. Don't try to grind, hand grind like 200 grams of pepper because you, you'll wear out your, your wrist joint. Okay, now, uh, this another thing that Matt shared with me yesterday is what you want to do with your rub is you want to sprinkle it on. Um, just get a nice light to moderate coating over the whole piece of meat. And, and I interrupted him at that point when he was telling me, you know, you want to sprinkle it on. And I said, oh, and then, and then you rub it, right? He's like, no, you don't rub it. Oh, what do you mean? It's called a rub. You rub it. He's like, nope, you're not meant to rub it. When you rub it, you actually end up building up sort of um, concentrated spots of it in some areas and, and moving it off other areas. You're better off just sprinkling it. So I'm like, well, why didn't they call it a sprinkle? That would make more sense. Um, but maybe it's just not as know, manly. Uh, the whole smoking thing seems to be pretty uh, manly sort of thing. So apparently it's called a rub, but you don't actually rub it. That's, that's it. That's the prep. This is one of the things I love about smoking meat is there is so little work involved in preparing it. Uh, particularly if you get the butcher to do the hard bit of taking the skin off and the fat off and preparing it for you, even trussing it up. See your local butcher. Right, so we've got our rub or sprinkle on. Uh, now it's time to put it in the oven and get our smoke going. So our pork is in the oven uh, and we've got our basket of charcoal here. Uh, and I've just put in a couple of those lumps of apple wood there and you can see already that they're starting to smolder, uh, which, which is fantastic. Now, I'm not relying on those. I'm just showing you this method. Um, it, it certainly works, but today I'm gonna be relying on the pellets to really develop the bulk of the smoke for me. Right, there's a few methods of lighting the pellets. You can use fire lighters to get your pellets up and going. Uh, I like to use this bad boy. Uh, I just like having it around, it just makes me feel better. Uh, but this works really well for lighting them up. So I, I actually just give them a good uh, bit of uh, flame uh, and then I make sure I blow them out. You don't want them to actually burn with a live flame, you just want them to smolder. Cool. 
And then once they're going, I like to just let them just burn a tiny bit for about 10 seconds or so. You can already see that smoke starting to develop. And that means that they're, they're properly lit. And then once they're up and going, then I blow them out. Have a look at the amount of smoke that these things give off. And you can just see how the meat is sitting in that layer of smoke. Um, with the, the air being drawn in is drawing the smoke back under the grill and then it's rolling over the top of the meat and up and out the chimney. Right, now uh, this may seem very obvious, but we need to smoke with the door almost closed. If we leave the door open, we're gonna be losing too much heat. There's gonna be lots of cold air rushing in uh, and, and cooling the oven down. So we wanna actually have the door almost closed, but we can't shut it completely. If we do that, then we've got no oxygen to feed the pellets and to keep our charcoal burning. So we're going to put the door all the way into the opening and then just pivot it back about 10 mil, half an inch uh, off one side. And what you'll find is that's just enough air to feed the fire, to feed that little bit of charcoal uh, and to keep those pellets going and it'll allow the smoke to come out and up and past it. Now, the last thing that I would want you to think is, oh, but Ben, I've got the P85, I've got your precast oven. You're doing all your smoking in your brick oven. Why didn't you tell me uh, that I couldn't do it in the P85? Well, good news. You can do it in the P85. And in fact, we're going to do it at the same time. I've got a second, almost identical shoulder of pork here, ready to go in with its spoink wing all complete. Uh, and so we're gonna put this in the P85. Now the difference between the P85 and the D105, the, the precast and our, and our most popular brick oven, really is the heat up and cool down time. Uh, and so the D105 took, when I fired it, two days ago, it took about two and a half hours to get all the way up to 400 degrees. But then uh, that day I shut the oven down uh, and then I just let it slowly cool. So for, it took a full nearly 48 hours for it to cool all the way down to about 140. The P85 on the other hand, one of its benefits is it has that quick heat up time. An hour and 15 minutes gets you all the way up to 400 degrees. Uh, so the trade-off is, of course, it's got a quicker cool down time. So for it to cool from uh, 400 down to uh, 140 took less time. So I actually fired this one yesterday uh, and then I, um, uh, I, I let it start cooling down. I actually found that it was gonna be too hot. Uh, it was still at 250 degrees last night. So I actually deliberately left the door open slightly to help it cool down a little faster. But what's my point in saying all of this stuff? You can absolutely do smoking in your P85 oven, as you're about to see. Right, so you have your meat in the oven and your first temptation is going to be to open the door and see how it's going. And to do that every five minutes, just because you're so excited and you just want to know what's going on. One of the really important things with smoking is you're not meant to do that. You really need to put it in at this point and then put the door in, leave it ajar so you're getting a tiny bit of air drawn in to feed the charcoal and the, the, the pellets, uh, but then just leave it. Let it sit there. It's gonna take two to three hours to get to the, to the next phase where we're gonna wrap it in foil. Uh, and so what we wanna do is just leave it without messing with it. Now, the reason we wanna mess with it, we wanna open the door, is we wanna know how it's going. And there are ways where you can track how it's going without having to open the door. And one of those is having a smart thermometer. Now, there are heaps of these on the market uh, and there's some fantastic options out there. Dave, it's a whole thing. There's uh, lots of different types. There's Bluetooth ones that look like a metal pencil that you just put in the meat and that sends a signal to your phone via a Bluetooth connection. Um, then there are another sort of type which is more a wired uh, smart thermometer where it has a central uh, sort of base station and then it has thermocouples or probes uh, connected by small stainless steel cables back to the main unit. Uh, and that's what we're using today. We've got a product called Fireboard which is really cool. It's made in the USA uh, and it is a pretty amazing product 
And the thing that I really like about this particular model, this is the Fireboard Pro, uh, and the Pro model uses thermocouples as the probes, as the temperature sensors. Uh, most of the other smart thermometers on the market use what's called a thermistor. A thermistor is a very similar sensor. They look the same. You'd, you'd hold them up and go, well, what's the difference between these two? The difference is that one is rated to around 300 degrees, so the thermistor goes to around the 300 degree mark, whereas a thermocouple, you can take over 700 Celsius, right? And that means that it's really well suited to being used in a wood-fired oven because, hey, you could just use a smart thermometer for your low and slow cooking uh, and only use it for that, and so just use a thermistor style of smart thermometer. Uh, but then you wouldn't be able to use it for your higher temperature cooking because you'll kill the, the probes, the thermistor type probes just won't survive those temperatures. So that's what I really love about the Fireboard Pro is that we can take it up to these extreme temperatures uh, and it will handle that just fine. So how it works, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's got its central uh, unit that actually connects to your home Wi-Fi. So you uh, follow the, the steps, you hook it up to your home Wi-Fi, uh, and it will actually relay all of the data that it's getting from the probes to the cloud where it stores it for, a, I think it's months uh, of data that you can actually store on the cloud once you're signed up. Uh, and you can then get it on your phone anywhere. You don't have to be in any kind of range of it. And that's what I like about this unit. I can run down to the shops and you know, get some condiments, get some sides for it while I've got something smoking and I can still keep track of how everything's going. Uh, so the Fireboard actually has three separate probes. Uh, so it can uh, keep track of three channels at one time. So you could have one probe in the meat would be a good idea. Uh, you could have another probe measuring the ambient uh, air temperature inside the oven. And hey, maybe you have a third probe uh, somewhere else, like uh, could be another one in the oven, or you, I actually like to measure the external temperature of my brickwork uh, to see how the dome is cooling down. But that's just a nerdy thing. Don't feel like you need to do that. Right, um, so that's, that's one way, is you could use a smart thermometer to track how the oven is behaving, how, how hot is the meat getting, what's the internal temperature of the oven. So if I notice that it's getting down below say 120 degrees, I'm gonna get some charcoal and just top up that little charcoal basket. And with the fireboard, I can actually set uh, limits on that particular channel. So my internal air temperature channel, I can set up a limit saying when it reaches 120, send me an SMS and I'll get a message saying you've, you've hit your, your lower limit. I can come out and put some more charcoal on and bump the temperature back up. Uh, of course, you can do the same thing with the meat. So uh, we're actually aiming to get our uh, pork up to about 65, 60 to 65 degrees Celsius before we do the next step of wrapping it in foil. And so I'll set a, a, a limit on that channel saying when it reaches 60 degrees, send me a message, uh, let me know and then I can come out and do the next thing. So that's certainly one way of doing things. These are amazing, uh, and these are something that we do have for sale, so by all means, check those out. But again, there's lots of great options out there, so have a look around, figure out what's gonna be best for you. Another way of doing it is a more low-tech way. You don't have to have a smart thermometer. I do love toys, I love toys. Uh, and this is a pretty cool toy. This is actually one of the coolest toys I've opened in a long time. But there's other ways of keeping tabs on it. So you can actually come out and have a look at your oven. Even using this gauge here on the side, I can see that I'm still sitting at about 132 degrees Celsius. So I'm in the range that I wanna be uh, for my internal temperature and that's another way of doing it. Uh, so I can keep track of it, just come and have a look at that every half an hour or so, make sure I'm still sitting within the range uh, that I was after. When it comes to checking the temperature of the meat, so you could use a smart thermometer, have that relay the data back to you, or you could use something like this, um, uh, just a digital probe. Uh, I really like these because they give you an almost instantaneous reading. There are some analog ones, uh, which is more of a temperature gauge uh, with, a, with a dial. They can take quite a bit of time to actually 
tell you the temperature uh, to actually come up. Whereas something like this will give me a reading very, very quickly once I put it into the meat. Uh, so when I get to that 60, 65 degree mark, so when the fireboard lets me know that we're up to temperature, I'm actually gonna show you this method as well where I actually probe the meat and double check, hey, is it, is it at the temperature that I'm after? So we put our pork in about three hours and 45 minutes ago, uh, and it usually takes three to four hours for the meat to come up from cold all the way up to between 70 and 75 degrees Celsius. That's the window that we're looking for, for the first phase of cooking, which is the smoking phase. Uh, once the meat has reached that temperature, so the, the temperature at the thickest part of the meat, right in the center, is in that range of 70 to 75 degrees, we're gonna take it out uh, and wrap it in foil. And the reason we wrap it in foil is to beat the stall, which is something I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I actually haven't looked in here uh, since, we, since we put it in. I've put in a little bit of charcoal a couple of times just to hold that temperature in that range that I was after. Uh, I've only had to put in maybe a couple of handfuls of charcoal to do that, which is pretty cool, given it's been three hours and 45 minutes. So let's have a look inside. So we're still getting plenty. Oh, that smoke, so good. Oh, that is delicious. Oh my word, it looks amazing. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull it out. So we still, the, uh, the smoke pellets are still burning. There's, uh, I reckon there's probably only another 15 minutes left in them, but um, they're still going. And uh, we're getting this fantastic layer of smoke just rolling over the, uh, the pork. This is, you gotta see this. All right, I'm gonna get it out. Oh my goodness, will you look at that? Oh. oh, that smells so good. And have a look at that bark. So you see here, we've got this lovely layer on here. And look at that, it's just set beautifully to the surface. And this is one of the things that you're looking for if you get into competition cooking, I'm, I'm told. Uh, they're looking for a bark that doesn't just easily scrape off the surface. So th those, uh, those spices that we put on before, that, that rub or the sprinkle, as we like to call it, um, that's set beautifully on the surface there. It's really gotten into the meat. So no mucking around though. What we need to do now is wrap this in foil. So we got the pork out. Uh, I've put the door back in the oven behind me, just keeping it slightly open, just to feed that bed of charcoal, just to keep the heat going in there. Uh, but what we wanna do now is get this wrapped in foil, nice and tight. So I've got some really big foil here. And you can use ordinary household foil to do this. I've just bought extra wide foil because it makes it a lot easier. With normal foil, you'd have to lay out two or three sheets side by side. To, to wrap it up. So what we wanna do is we wanna seal it. So you also should wear these awesome nitrile rubber gloves because all the pro barbecue guys seem to wear these and let's, I just wanna be cool. Jesus. Right. So that's all it needs. Just a few layers of foil around it. We want it sealed in. I don't, I don't want any steam to be escaping from this. I want it nice and snug and tight in its little foil blanket. So we're gonna pop this back in the pan and then I'm gonna put it straight back in the oven. It's gonna be another few hours uh, until we get this to 91 degrees Celsius, that's our target temperature. We can go a little higher, we can go to 95, uh, but we're, going, we're looking for 91 degrees, and then we're gonna do a probe test to see if it's tender. So we're looking for two things at that temperature. Do we have the temperature, number one, and is it nice and soft and buttery and just falling apart at that temperature? If it's not, we're gonna leave it in there and keep checking it every 10, 15 minutes, until we get that beautiful, tender uh, pork that we're after. Mm -hmm. 
So our pork is back in, I've got the door back in, but again, I've just left it cracked open about 10 mil, half an inch, uh, so that we getting that little bit of airflow in, not to feed the smoke pellets anymore. Smoke's irrelevant now, it's wrapped in foil. No more flavor getting into it. It's got plenty of flavor as it is. Uh, but what we need that for is just that little bit of oxygen to feed that bit of charcoal. I'm gonna keep an eye on my temperatures. Uh, so again, I wanna maintain that 130 to 150 range because Joel, being the impatient man that he is, uh, wants to get out of here at a reasonable time. Uh, and so, we're gonna maintain that temperature so that we get a nice steady cook. Again, you could go for lower temperatures uh, and really let it uh, you know, take a bit longer, uh, but we're aiming to get this done in the next three to four hours is what I'm targeting. Now you might be wondering, well, wait a second, how is the pork in the P85 going? It's going just as well. Oh man, I can't, it's really dark in there. I'm gonna pull it out. Oh my word. Look at that. Oh, that looks delicious. Let's check our internal temperature. So we've actually got this to over 75 degrees. Now that's not a problem. It's not like, oh no, it's it's a, it's a bad thing, it's, it's a, I, I let it get too hot. Remember, we need this to get to 91 degrees. The reason that we wrap it in foil is because we are trying to beat the stall. The stall is a, a term for what happens when you're slow cooking meat. At about that 75 degree mark, um, the temperature can stop rising. The oven temperature can still be nice and hot, but for some reason, the temperature of the meat stops rising. The reason is the water is evaporating out of it and that evaporation is actually cooling the meat. And so you can find, you can be watching your smart thermometer and watching your meat temperature going up, 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 and gets to that 75 degree mark or so, and then it just flat lines for hours. It is anxiety inducing. <laughs> and so what we have here is we're actually seem to be almost beating the stall without wrapping it in foil. Now, I have experimented with that. Uh, I have tried just leaving it like this and I found that it actually does dry it out quite a bit. Um, and I didn't beat the stall. I ended up having to wrap it in foil anyway. So we're gonna wrap this in foil and get it back in here. But this one, this is going really well. All right, so the pork is on its last leg of, of the cook. And I just wanna take this opportunity just to talk about that heat management uh, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and keeping track of the temperature of the oven uh, and, and making sure that it's staying in that band, uh, that bracket that we're after. So I got a message earlier from the fire board telling me that the temperature had dropped below 135 degrees, which was uh, a level that I had set earlier for that particular channel. Uh, so I can come out and I'm gonna put on some charcoal just to bump that temperature back up, uh, make sure it doesn't fall any further. Now, if you don't have a smart thermometer, remember if you have a thermometer mounted through the wall of the oven, this is actually gonna give you a really accurate reading. Uh, so if you're finding your temperatures dropping uh, below your desired temperature on that, hey, great, put some charcoal in. And that's how you'll need to monitor yours. You won't necessarily have a message delivered to your phone. You might just need to come out and have a look every 20 minutes or so, just to make sure that the temperature is where you want it to be. If you're in a situation, uh, say with our P85 here, it doesn't have a temperature gauge mounted through the wall. And we actually don't often really recommend that people do that because mounting a thermo well and thermometer in the P85 is actually quite a mission. There's a lot of drilling involved. Um, there's a risk of spalling of the casting on the inside when you do that drilling. So we actually don't usually recommend people mount a uh, gauge through the wall of the oven. And so if you're in that situation where you're saying, Ben, I don't, I don't have a gauge in the wall um, and I, I don't actually have a, you know, a fireboard. Um, have a think about getting one. Not even necessarily the fireboard itself. They are fantastic, but they are top of the range. Uh, and that is what we tend to, to sell. Uh, there are lots of other options out there on the market that you can try that are relatively inexpensive. Uh, and they, they have different features and so on, but well worth having a look at those, particularly the standard smoker 
unit ones uh, that use the misters. You can get those quite inexpensively. Uh, you just won't be able to use those at the really high temperatures. Um, last thing I do want to cover is the gauge in the door. Uh, and um, you might think, oh, well, I've got a temperature gauge in the door. I'll use that. Now, remember, if your door is closed, fully sealed, so the chamber is sealed, then yes, that door gauge is then accurate. But if your door is propped open slightly to let fresh air in to say feed some charcoal, give it some oxygen, you're getting cold air coming into the oven and guess where it's passing? It's passing right over the back of the gauge and cooling it down. So if I look at the oven behind me, uh, while over here I've got 130 degrees or so, here I'm reading, oh, it's, it's at about 110. Uh, and so the door thinks it's actually a lot cooler than the rest of the oven. And that's because we've got that cold air being drawn in around the back of the door, cooling the end of that probe. Uh, so I hope that's helpful, hope that makes sense, but uh, we are doing really well, making really good time. We've, we've been able to hold both ovens comfortably in that bracket of 130 to 150, and it's been really easy. Um, I, I honestly, uh, I thought I might be putting in a little bit more charcoal a bit more often, but I've probably only had to put in fuel maybe once an hour, if that. Um, and what the other thing I've noticed is as uh, the, the cooks progressed, as the pork has heated up more, I've actually had to top it up less because now the pork is not cooling down. The meat's not cooling down the surrounding air uh, as, as quickly. So I'm actually... Uh, not having to put as much charcoal on. Uh, I, I think I've, in the D105 behind me, I've probably put on about three handfuls, maybe three and a half handfuls. If, if that's a, I have big hands, but that's, that's a measure. Um, the P85 would be less than that. I've, I've probably only put in two handfuls into that, um, which is really cool when you think about, um, we're keeping these uh, quite large things. We're, we're able to hold a really stable temperature just by putting in some heat beads or some charcoal, uh, you're able to just hold the temperature for as long as you like. Really cool. Um, I hope you're as excited about this as I am. Uh, anyway, um, we are nearly there. Uh, so we'll see you back shortly and hopefully we'll be pulling them out. So our pork in here has uh, actually exceeded 91 degrees. It's sitting at about 92.7 uh, and so that should be just about right. But what we want to check is not only that it has reached the right temperature, but it's also the right consistency. It's soft. We're looking for it to be just buttery and soft. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a wooden chopstick to uh, probe the meat. And we're basically looking for almost no resistance. Now I'm looking, I'm using a wooden skewer, not chopstick, skewer. I'm using a wooden skewer because it does have a little bit more resistance than a metal one would. So that's gonna just tell me a little bit more. Now, if it turns out that it's not soft enough, uh, we'll put it back in for another 10 minutes or so, and we'll pull it out and we'll try it again. But when I probe it a second time, if I have to, I'll use the same hole in the foil, but I'll do it on a different angle, right? Well, the reason for that is, if I keep probing in exactly the same spot, it will feel softer the second time because I've already made a hole there. Right, so we deliberately just probe in a slightly different direction the second time if that's needed. But I'm hoping we're gonna pull it out and it'll be soft as butter. So let's just pop this in and just see how that goes. I'm still feeling a bit of resistance there. I'll just try another spot, just make sure I'm not, just open up the foil just a little bit so I'm not feeling the foil's resistance. Still a bit firm. I'm gonna let that go a little bit longer. Uh, so remember, um, anywhere between 91 and 96 degrees is absolutely fine for pulled pork. So I'm gonna pop that back in and we'll check it again shortly. Okay, so we're nearly at 96 degrees. Uh, now I did double check my notes that I'd taken from Matt and it actually turns out you can take it to 98 is fine. So anywhere between that 91 degrees to 98 degrees uh, is, is, is fine. It's all about that tenderness that we're after. Uh, so we're gonna probe it again with the skewer and just see where we're at. All right, so we'll just pick a different direction this time. Still a little bit of resistance. I'm gonna take it all the way to 98. 
now that I double checked the numbers and got that one right. So I'm gonna take this just a little bit further just to see if I can get a little bit more tenderness out. So our pork shoulder in the D105 has just gone over 92 degrees. So we're gonna pull that out and check the tenderness with the old skewer method. Oh, that is nice. That is nice and soft. I'll just try. It's quite soft. I'm, again, I'm gonna take it uh, a little bit further. Uh, I feel like we could get maybe get it a little softer with a little bit more temperature. So again, we can take this to 98 degrees so uh, without doing it any harm. So I'm gonna let it go up a little further and check it again. So we have got our pork shoulder out of the P85. So the P85 was running just a tiny bit hotter than the D105 throughout the day. And this piece of meat is about 500 grams uh, less weight, so it was always going to cook a little bit faster. Uh, we've taken it all the way to 97.5 degrees, and now when I put this skewer in, it's just really like gliding in. There's, there's still a little bit of resistance, but it is pretty darn soft in there. And it's going to get softer because the next step is we need to let it rest. What we're going to do is take a bath towel. Can I highly, highly recommend not using your wife's favorite bath towel because it will never be the same again. I don't care how many times you wash it, it will always have a faint, delightful smell of pulled pork. Uh, so we're gonna take our pork in its jacket and pop this in here. And then I wanna remember which side is up, right? So remembering it's got some holes in it. It's also where it's most likely to leak. Right now in here, there's heaps of delicious juices that we actually want to keep. We don't want to lose the juices in here. So we want to roll it up in the towel, but remembering we want to keep this side up because otherwise it's all going to, all those lovely juices are going to leak out onto the towel and make it into a sodden mess. All right, so down, up. So you can see already, trying to leak through there and up. all right so got it wrapped in a towel and the idea of that is to keep the heat in to so it doesn't cool down too quickly we can wrap, we wrap this in a towel and then usually what you would do is you would put it into an esky if you have one uh, if you don't have an esky you can pop it in your electric or gas oven inside just don't turn it on it's a nice insulated environment, so it just adds that little bit of extra insulation to keep this nice and warm. Now, if you don't have either of those available to you, you can just wrap it up in a second towel and that will do a very similar job. We wanna let this rest for a period of time. Now, there's lots of conversation out there on the interwebs about how long that should be. According to my guru, Matt, uh, it is somewhere between half an hour and five hours. Okay, anywhere from 30 minutes uh, all the way up to five hours is okay. The sweet spot in, in Matt's mind is one hour, it's just about right. Um, so if you're hungry like I am, uh, you'll, you'll give, it at least, give it at least that hour, and give it that maximum chance to really soften uh, and uh, just, just relax in there. So we'll pop that aside now and uh, we'll get the other one out very shortly, so yeah. This has been brilliant. I, the smells that I'm smelling right now are amazing. And I'm just so pumped to be able to share this with you because it's just, it's taking your oven from something you cook amazing pizzas with, you know, entertain the family to something that you can like do like a big piece of meat. I could have done three of these in either of these ovens. They would fit. I right? don't have to just do one, um, but you can you know, do this and then you can feed a whole bunch of people with three kilos of pulled pork. It goes a long way. Uh, so anyway, sorry, I'm excited. Uh, but we'll be back soon uh, and we'll, be, we'll have both of them wrapped. They'll both be rested and we'll be ready to shred them up. All right, we've been very patient. We have waited the full hour. So now it's a moment of truth. Uh, we're going to unwrap our little beautiful little perfectly wrapped pork. And again, we want to remember which side the, uh, the holes are in so that we don't lose too much of those juices and make a bit of a mess.
That is beautiful. We've got a very, very small smoke ring. Not a heavy smoke ring. I'm seeing just a little bit of pink, uh, a little bit of coloration on the inside there. Uh, but it smells amazing and it's just so soft. Now there's probably some technique to this that I have no idea about and that's okay because I'm learning and, and that's what I'm looking forward to you guys doing as well is having a go. Um, the worst thing that can happen is, oh well it, it didn't work out and you know it's, it's not actually a particularly expensive cut of meat. Um, have a go at this because the results when it works, wow, far out. It smells incredible. Have a look at that. That, it looks like a mess, but it smells heavenly. I am so happy with this result. This looks amazing. Now, we're going to eat some of this right away. Uh, if you weren't, uh, you would want to cover this right away with foil and put it aside. You can actually refrigerate this if you want to, reheat it later on. It still tastes amazing. I am... So, so, so very happy with how that went. These turned out better than I had hoped. Uh, and I, I just, both ovens were so easy to hold at the right temperature, to keep them in that range. It was, it was actually really easy to do using those little baskets of charcoal. It was fantastic. Um, smell of vision is not a thing. You can't smell this. It smells incredible. It tastes amazing. I may have some on my face. I do apologize for that. Um, what I'm told uh, people do at this point um, is actually uh, put in some barbecue sauce or mix in vinegar and things like that. I'm gonna leave all that up to the experts out on the interwebs. Uh, that is not my field. But uh, what I am gonna do is make up some nice brioche buns, a bit of coleslaw, a bit of barbecue sauce, and uh, I am gonna chow down on those bad boys. Uh, but I really appreciate you watching this video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and what I'm hoping, that you've gotten out of this is not, you know, somehow that I've passed on some wisdom about smoking. That's not the goal. The goal of this video is to encourage you to think about, wait, how else can I use my wood-fired oven? Can I smoke in it? Absolutely you can. And you can do fantastic smoking at that. Uh, so uh, that is pretty much all from me. But once again, thank you so much for watching uh, and uh, really just uh, appreciate uh, all of you guys out there who subscribed and whatnot, um, but enough, I need to eat.